All right, so here we have a scenario where we have this rod. It's going to get released and it's going to rotate along here. And we want to think about, like, we're going to neglect the mass of the rod and just talk about the point masses there. And we want to know the kinetic energy of the system consisting of the rod and the two masses when the rod swings in the horizontal position above. Okay, so we want to think about how much kinetic energy is here. So first of all, so what is our system? If we're going to do energy like this, we're probably going to do conservation of energy, but I want to make sure you understand why we're going to do that. Right, the system is going to be the masses plus, go ahead and include the rod. The rod has no mass, so it doesn't really matter if you include it or not, plus the earth, okay? Now, um, now, so why do we include all of those things? Is So we can think about doing a free body diagram, decide if any work, work is being done by external forces. So if we think about during the motion, we have M2G, we have M1G, and um, there's something on the axle. The axle is probably holding it up, right? So there's a force from the axle. So overall, as this thing rotates around, right, gravity doesn't do any work because it's internal to the system, right? So it's part of our Earth. So it's internal to the Earth system. We're going to take care of it in gra with gravitational potential energy. So we don't worry about the force done by gravity. The axle force knows, doesn't move the entire time, though. So even though the axle is external, not part of our system, Right, it's external to our system. However, it doesn't move, so the displacement is zero. So this also doesn't do any work. So that's the next step, right? The draw the free body diagram. And then three, that determines that the work is zero. And that, that's why we can do conservation of energy. Now, what if the axle were moving? What if I were this thing were spinning while I were lifting it up? Then the axle is going to do some work, right? Because then the force and the displacement, there's a displacement parallel to the force. So if I had something that were, that were spinning, and I were lifting it up, I would be doing the, uh, th this axle would then be doing work on this thing. If I like use strings to lift it up, the axle was pushing up on it and it was moving upward. So, but in this case, the axle is not moving. So the work is zero. So that implies that the change in energy is zero, right? So we just need to think about the, how much energy we start with and then how much energy we end with. So the initial energy is the energy in this state right now. So because it's the Earth, we have to include some gravitational potential energy. And now we're going to, you could use kinetic energy as one half mv squared. You can honestly do that. But um, it's easier to think of it as the axis and just say the kinetic energy is rotational kinetic energy. I think you'll find that it's easier overall. Like you, you could do it either way, technically. You could do one half mv squared if you wanted to. So the initial energy, let's, let's make the lowest point here. We'll make this h equals zero. So let's think about the potential energy we, we have here. And we, there's no kinetic energy to start because we're releasing it. Um, we're, uh, it's going to be released. It's released, which means the initial velocity is going to be kind of zero. So we release it, right? So there's no kinetic energy. There's gravitational potential energy. M2 is looking at H equals zero, so it doesn't have any gravitational potential energy. M1 does have some gravitational potential energy. And the distance, the MGH, what is its height is a distance L. Right? So that's the initial energy. How much energy does it end with? Well, now it's spinning. So we have some kinetic energy of both objects. So we want to do the total I of both systems, some kinetic energy. And then any gravitational potential energy? Well, yeah, actually, because they're both located a distance L over 2 above, which is, you know, because the diameter is L. So this distance is L over 2. So it's M1 g l over 2 plus m2 g l over 2 right because each of these now have some potential energy over there and so um last step is just say work is the change in energy right but because the work is zero these two energies the change in energy is zero so these two energies are equal to each other plus uh we could just combine this m1 plus m2 g L over 2. And then you can subtract this, so you get 1 half I omega squared is going to be the difference here. It's going to be Mg, M1 G L minus this, or it's going to be M1 minus M2 G L over 2. If you distribute and then do the math there, right? So this is how much kinetic energy we have left, right? What's the kinetic energy? Just this amount here, right here. What is the angular speed of the rod when it swings through the horizontal position? So we want to know what the angular speed of the rod is. So we're going to solve for the omega here. Now the I refers to the entire rotational inertia of the system. So you're going to do the mr squared of every object. 
for the point masses. So it's m1, l over 2 is the distance from there to there squared. It's always distance to the axis of rotation, l over 2 squared. Oh, um, we could plug in some numbers for these, I suppose. So this is going to be m1 plus m2 times l squared over 4 is equal to i. So then what we're going to have here is m1 minus m2 g times l over 2 is equal to 1 half times 1 fourth m1 plus m2 l squared omega squared. Okay, And then we're just going to solve for the omega. So first of all, let's just cancel a little bit. One of the l's will cancel. The 2's will cancel here. And so then the omega is going to be square root of multiply this by 4. divided by m1 plus m2, and then put l on the denominator. And now all you're going to do is just plug in the numbers we have for m1. m1 is 4. m2 is 3. g is 9.8. 4 plus 3 times the l, which is 2. Okay, so we just use our calculator to calculate the square root of 4 times 9.8, divided by 7, divided by 2. It's going to be 1.67 radians per second. And let's compute. Um, I didn't compute the actual energy here. This would have been 4 minus, 4 minus 3 times 9.8 times L2 over 2. And that would have been 9.8, just 9.8, 9.8 joules. Okay. Okay, part C. Suppose the mass of the rod is not negligible and we were to include it in our calculations. When the rod swings through the horizontal position, the kinetic energy of the system will... Well, the kinetic energy is just how much potential energy we started with. So the kinetic energy remains unchanged because we started with the same potential energy. We're going to end with the same kinetic energy. However, the angular speed will decrease because some of the kinetic energy will be part of the part of the rod rods kinetic energy which means overall we're going to have less kinetic energy for the um the masses the other way to think about this if you don't want to answer it this way or an alternative way to answer this part here is that the um the i increases but one half i omega squared is the same so a same so the omega decreases Um, for the first one, to justify this one here, is there's the but still system still starts with the same mm, same potential energy, gravitation, same total energy, same energy. Now, okay, there's a slight tricky part when you're saying the same energy. Um, technically, the mass does. There is some potential energy from the mass itself here, but it has the same potential energy later. It's located at l over two for the rod, so there's no change in the potential energy of the rod technically. But I think I would still just kind of state it like that. <laughs> 